and uh, of course I've got my face covered now before I uncover my face most of you realize that of course I'm not really uh, in Wuhan I'm in fact somewhere much more beautiful and much more relaxing and much more isolated but of course before I take off my mask uh, you all know that I am a bearded gentleman well no longer and I will explain in a moment what that's all about. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, uh, Michelle, you need to allow me to share my screen, please. I can't share it at the moment. So I'm gonna to talk to you um, about what I've been getting up to uh, over the last few weeks. Um, and uh, before I do, uh, I just need to Michelle to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing here. Uh, so just give us a couple of seconds while the glitches get sorted out. The host has disabled participant screen sharing. Um, so can you enable participant screen sharing, please? Michelle, if you make Lawrence the co-host, you'll automatically get screen sharing. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. Um, now, I don't know what I've done now, so let's just see what happens. Uh, uh, dum, dum. Um, sorry, just give me a second while I try and work this all out. Um, I really don't know whether this is going to work right or not. Let's find out. What are you seeing? Are you seeing? You're seeing what you shouldn't be seeing. So that's no good. Uh, give me one second. The, it, it was all beautifully organised. Um, and then, of course, it all stopped working. Um, so I'm sharing the wrong screen for reasons I can't actually understand. Um, so the, the visor, of course, is to protect me, whereas the mask was to protect you. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll talk a bit why my beard's gone in a minute, but I, I'm um, talking about research over the next 45 minutes or so. And I'm not going to talk about individuals. And whatever I say should be understood in the context that this is sort of in the world of ideas. Um, and please don't try to relate it to yourselves um, specifically. You can ask questions, as Michelle said, on the chat, and I'll try and answer them as we go along. Um, uh, um, so um, I want to say a big thank you to the doctors who spoke last week. Um, Charlotte, of course, from Primary Care. Um, and uh, oh, this is not working well, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to work fine. Okay, that's better. Um, Stephen, who was speaking from secondary care, and Walter, of course, the meeting between primary and secondary care. Um, like Stephen, I'm a gastroenterologist, but I work in what's called a tertiary care setting, a sort of a teaching hospital and a university. Now, I have the same training as Stephen, but my job means that I really no longer do general medicine. I do research, and my main focus has been for the last 20 years the complications of acid reflux, a condition called Barrett's esophagus, esophageal cancer, and then more recently into more general prevention of cancer. And I've moved much more into bowel cancer prevention, and uh, we've been working a lot in artificial intelligence. And just before COVID uh, hit, I was appointed as the UK lead for the British Society of Gastroenterology for development of artificial intelligence within the gastroenterology sphere. And six weeks ago, I was setting up a national effort and was due to, was due to start in June, uh, all around uh, implementing artificial intelligence in the endoscopy and gastroenterology sphere. Um, I'm the clinical director of a centre at UCL called WISE. It's a welcome funded centre. It's a multi-million pound centre bringing a collaboration of doctors and engineers to speed the introduction of surgical technology into the clinical arena. Um, and I just want to repeat one or two of the things that were said last week. Um, you know, the, the, the NHS is open for business uh, and we have definitely seen a huge drop off in people coming to hospitals who really should have come. And we know that when we can identify uh, in part of our cancer prevention strategies, people who are at high risk and who should be coming for testing and people are not coming at the moment. So <clears throat> we, we've got a lot of um, well organised things in place to make sure that people are not at risk and we would really encourage people who are not well please to avail themselves of the NHS which is really still working. Um, one of the things that Walter said which I think is really important is that kindness is key and there's no doubt that our strength is our people um, and you know it may seem a bit funny to you but on those Thursday nights when people go outside to clap 
um, I, I actually I actually feel quite proud you know when I hear it when I hear the clapping um, so please do keep clapping um, I've had uh, I, got, I received an email actually on Friday, and this just gives you an idea of the sorts of things that are coming up. Uh, somebody from Moorfields wrote to us saying about wanting to know about additional gear they should be wearing in the immediate near future. Um, and are we in the centre that I run aware of any engineering solutions whereby looking at the bin, in the binocular microscope would not be affected while wearing the mask and the visor? Um, clinical examination of the side lamps difficult and manageable. Um, you know, how, how are we going to manage it? How are we going to manage it? Because there may be a safety element. And, and so these are sorts of things that the people I work with every day, all day are involved in. So what has actually changed in my life in the last six weeks? Well, normally I do a relatively small amount of direct patient facing work. I do about 10 to 15 hours a week seeing patients. Uh, and the rest of the time I'm doing research and training. I have about uh, eight to 10 PhD students who are under my, uh, under my direct uh, supervision um, and all the artificial intelligence work that I do. And, um, but recently I've been back more on the front line doing more ward rounds, uh, endoscopy, virtual clinics. But curiously, I, I, I sort of found myself in a slightly odd position because in week one, just before the lockdown, I had a dry cough and I felt unwell. I self-isolated although technically uh, wasn't really required to do so at that point. Was it COVID, wasn't it COVID, we still don't know. Uh, within, a, within a matter of a day or two, my young, my, one, of, one of my sons, who's a doctor, had a cough. And then we had the problem because I had to self-isolate for two weeks and that, by that time it was actually all mandated. Um, and so there was quite a long time where I was working from home. And then, ladies and gentlemen, um, something interesting happened. And uh, the interesting thing is, this. Um, so I came across <coughs> Professor Ramani Mubasinga. Now Ramani uh, is a colleague of mine um, at UCL uh, who I appointed uh, as a professor uh, last year um, uh, in perioperative medicine and critical care. And Ramani um, is now the national lead for critical care for NHS England. Um, and I'll tell you why that's so interesting in just a moment or two. But before I go to that, I want to explain to you <clears throat> what research is. So research is the process of solving problems and finding facts in an organized way. And what does that mean? So you start with an observation, we all see things, um, but the trick within research is once you see something, you formulate a question, and good research is based on good questions, and you then use some sort of systematic, reproducible method to answer the question. And that's the scientific method. Okay, so what you want to do is have a good question, and not all good questions are worth not all questions are worth answering. The trick is to find a good question and then find a systematic, reproducible way to answer that question so that you know the answer you get is 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 valuable. Um, and I'd now like to just show you this. Um, so this is something I would call not research. Uh, this is um, the president of the United States of America, oops, who um, made this following comment on a tweet on the 10.13 on March the 21st, 2020. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin taken together have a real chance to be one of the biggest game changers in the history of medicine. The FDA, the Federal um, Drugs Administration, has moved mountains, thank you. Hopefully they will both work. That's hydroxychloroquine works better with azithromycin. It's National Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. Looks impressive. I'm not going to show you the YouTube thing. Oh, um, but interestingly, an hour and a half later, we get the, this this tweet. Trump says the FDA has approved chloroquine for use in COVID-19. A minute later, Trump says still collecting evidence of chloroquine efficiency. In other words, they haven't actually proved it. A minute later, Trump says chloroquine risks are low and well known. And then half an hour later, the FDA says he has not approved chloroquine for COVID-19 use. Now this is not very helpful. Okay, does chloroquine help? Doesn't it? Well, President Trump thought it did. And the most useful thing that came out of this was that um, the people who sell chloroquine started making enormous profits. The, the world locked down on chloroquine and the price jumped by 
um, actually uh, more than tenfold, which is rather important, as I might tell you a bit later on. But then you have um, this. <laughs> Jennifer Gunter, I reported this tweet for encouraging self-harm. These medications, when taken together, can cause a serious and potentially fatal irregular heartbeat. They can only be taken together with careful inpatient monitoring. And who is this Jennifer Gunter? I am an obstetrician gynecologist and a pain medicine physician. I write a lot about sex, science and social media, but sometimes I write about other things because, well, why not? Well, why not is because actually it can cause a lot of trouble. Um, and there's no point telling people things that are not the truth. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, let's just keep going. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the types of study that there are available. So if you want to understand a disease, um, you, can, um, you can look at it in many different ways. Uh, the epidemiologists look at big, big issues around disease. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the basic scientists uh, will go back into the laboratory uh, and try to understand how the virus works. Um, you then may have the, 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 the translational uh, the translational researchers who are interested perhaps in diagnostic test development or drug and vaccine development. Um, uh, and all of these things are different types of research and all of them are, are relevant types of research. Um, and I'm now going to try and switch again. Um, just give me one second. So I want to show you um, this is from the clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov is a list, um, uh, is where you, where you list your studies. And if I click on the map of all COVID-19 -relate, COVID related studies, you can see um, that there are studies which are led from all over the world. If I click on the European studies, um, we bring up the 30 studies that are going on in the UK. And if I now look at 30, yes, when I look yesterday, there were only 29. Um, when I come up to number 29, um, the crown coronation study, if I click on that one, uh, you will come through uh, and you will discover that my name appears somewhere right down the bottom of it. Um, so it, you can actually drill down uh, to an enormous amount of information from the clinicaltrials.gov website if you're really interested. But there are literally hundreds of studies happening at the moment uh, in this field. Um, so I also want to show you um, just how complicated uh, the research area is. Um, so this is a, a map of research as it happens in the United Kingdom. Um, the National Institute for Health Research is one of the real uh, jewels in the crown of the British NHS. About 15, 20 years ago, um, the NHS realised that much research at basic level being done in the laboratory, the invention level, was not making it through into patient care. And so they set up the NIHR, and the NIHR, over its 20 years, has created a whole series of different um, streams of work to try and push basic inventions all the way through to diffusing into, into normative practice. M most of my work sits around the invention evaluation. I'm sort of an early translational researcher. Um, I'm paid by, by the UCL H Biomedical Research Centre. Um, I also am a co-investigator in an experimental cancer medicine centre, which is funded by Cancer Research UK. And, and then there are a whole series of funding uh, streams that you can research of patient benefit is a very well-known funding stream which uh, you identify something and then you try to uh, benefit the patients um, and you can apply for money for that. Um, so there, there, there's an enormous different array of research areas and I'm only going to talk to you to this evening about the things I know about. Now this is one of the things that I do know a little bit about and this is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I heard somebody talking about this earlier. Um, Bill Gates was really one of the first people to identify the importance of infectious diseases <clears throat> and particularly in um, resource poor countries. Uh, and the, the Gates Foundation has set itself up in COVID-19 to look at three areas, developing uh, diagnostics in which they collaborate with multiple partners, treatments 
where they've collaborated with the Wellcome Trust. Remember, I told you that I'm a clinical director of a Wellcome Centre at UCL, and also with MasterCard. And this is a $125 million collaboration to try and identify therapies. And then prevention uh, vaccines uh, and their collaboration with a, with a group called, called CEPI. Um, okay, before we get into that, let's just talk about beards and COVID-19. So I showed you before that I don't have a beard anymore. Um, so I've got a question for you. Can you grow a beard? Can you keep your beard? Is it okay when you've got COVID-19? Um, and one of the problems is this, the FFP3 mask, <clears throat> the masks that doctors and nurses wear when they are dealing with COVID-19 patients, um, doing particular, particularly doing certain uh, procedures. Um, so I do endoscopy as a gastroenterologist. These produce aerosols, they, um, lots of, uh, of particles of fluid, including viruses, going in the air. And these masks filter out more than 99% of the aerosols and they have a leak rate of less than two percent and you have to do a formal fit testing every time you put one of these things on to make sure that you have a perfect seal around the edge um, now you know when somebody's got a beard like this uh, or even a beard like this um, there's a bit of a problem with the seal or maybe there is maybe there isn't is there any research to confirm what the risks are well it turns out that in fact three years ago uh, the center for diseases control in the usa uh, worked uh, actually did some research trying to work out what the risks were and it turned out that if you're clean shaven you can see there's a mask there and you know, it, it, uh, it's not going to be too much of a problem however um, if you've got a full beard the mask uh, actually is sitting on the beard and it turns out there is something like 20 to a thousand times more leakage of air around the edges of the mask than clean shaven individuals. <clears throat> so with that in mind, I decided that it probably was not a very good idea uh, to keep my beard. Um, and and uh, so then the obvious thing to do was to get rid of the beard and to choose myself a different look, uh, such as perhaps a zapper moustache. Um, and so we tried that. Um, uh, unfortunately, Linda, my wife, didn't really like it, uh, and so the moustache had to go. Um, but uh, and that is why the moustache, the, the, the beard has gone, because it's safer not to have a beard. Um, what about public wearing face masks? You saw I, I put one on, you thought, might, have, might have thought it was a bit of a joke, but actually it's not so clear this is a joke. There is now uh, mounting indirect evidence to support the argument for the public wearing masks in the pandemic. So the virus remains viable in the air for several hours um, when it's released an aerosol. And these aerosols do seem to be blocked by surgical masks in laboratory experiments. And, and you've got to remember, actually, there are two things. One is the mask, if I wear it and I sneeze, I protect you. And the other one is not this mask, but the one I showed you before, that when you breathe, you protect me. Most of us are wearing masks actually to protect other people, not ourselves. And we know that individuals can be infectious for two and a half days before symptom onset. So if I wear a mask and I don't have any symptoms, I may well be protecting you from getting COVID-19. Um, and the community prevalence of COVID-19 is actually pretty high. And in fact, only this evening, uh, Germany, I noticed, have announced that everybody has to wear one of these masks in public. Curiously, um, after the SARS epidemic uh, in, in, the, in Asia 15 years ago, uh, many Asians started wearing these masks in public. Um, in England, uh, a month, uh, six weeks ago, 0% of the population was wearing them. A uh, research paper from a couple of weeks ago showed now that 11% of people are wearing them. And day by day, more and more people are wearing these masks as you, go out, as you can see. But I think that there is also an argument for wearing a visor because the visor actually stops the, the droplets hitting my face. So your droplets hitting my face. And modeling studies suggest that even a small reduction in community transmission could make a major difference to demand for hospital bed space and ventilators. And that's frankly what this whole issue of the lockdown has been about. So uh, on the 11th of March, and it seems like an age ago, the World Health, uh, World Health Organization declared that we had a global pandemic. And this was after a 13 fold rise in the number of cases outside China, trebling of the countries affected in two weeks, and the, the expression was the WHO had been assessing the outbreak around the clock 
were deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming <laughs> levels of inaction. And could somebody please mute themselves? Now, what it turns out is that the vast majority of cases are mild, and indeed some of them have no symptoms at all. Uh, about 15% um, 15 of cases are severe, and 5% are uh, alt A. Um, so 80% of cases are mild, 15% of cases are severe, and 5% of cases are critical. They're the ones who end up uh, having the uh, ventilation. Um, so it turns out there are populations who appear to be more susceptible than others. And I think you're probably all aware that the news is focusing on this, um, that healthcare workers do seem to be at increased risk of developing COVID-19. Um, and I'm trying to give you some of the evidence. Uh, I should just tell you, by the way, that um, there are approximately um, between 20 and 50 new scientific papers on COVID-19 being published every single day of the week. So I apologize if I'm out of date, but I'm trying to keep on top of stuff. It is, it is unbelievable the amount of stuff that's being published every day on this subject. And, it's, and of course, with every day that goes, more and more stuff's being published. Um, but interestingly, in China, 4% of those COVID-19 were healthcare workers, and by mid-March, 9% in Italy were healthcare workers. And, in, and I was talking to some of my colleagues on the wards uh, University College Hospital, um, and uh, one of my, my colleagues said to me last week, every single person on the ward at UCH was either a carer or a healthcare worker, or in some way doing caring for other people. This is a, it, it's skewed, of course, older people are, are affected more, but are so are the healthcare workers, and that has particular issues. Let's just talk briefly about vaccines. Um, so, um, as you know, there has, is no vaccine yet, and there's a whole, uh, whole set of questions about whether vaccination will work. Um, so uh, let me just explain briefly uh, about uh, vaccines. Um, the, what is happening with, with the vaccine is, you, is we're trying to identify um, a, something that is novel, that's only visible on the virus which we can then develop antibodies to, so that when the body sees it again, the, the body can then literally destroy it. And, and the, the thing that's most interesting on the coronavirus are these spike glycoproteins, these spike proteins on the, uh, the outside shell of the virus. The virus is a very, very simple um, molecule. <clears throat> it has uh, a series of uh, these proteins, on the shell and inside is something called RNA. RNA uh, is what we use uh, to, translate our to, tr you know, to translate our DNA into making proteins. Uh, vi this virus doesn't even have any DNA, it only has RNA, which then gets made by our body's own cells um, into these proteins, which then allow it to go and infect the next person. Now, in terms of virus, uh, virus vaccines, um, this particular graph is very interesting. And because uh, the range of technology platforms that are being evaluated uh, is just unbelievably wide. Uh, this never in the history of vaccine development has anything been done like this before. Um, uh, this long list, most of these things won't mean anything to any of you and they don't actually mean very much to me. But let me just briefly explain what's happening in Oxford. So the Oxford group are placing a little bit of the COVID RNA into a virus which is not COVID, it's actually a, a, um, an adenovirus vector. <clears throat> and that virus replicates inside the body. But what it's done is the, the RNA it's taken from the COVID only makes that spike protein. So what happens is that inside the human body, you make loads and loads of spike proteins, and that will then cause uh, an immune response to develop to this foreign protein. And then if the person it, sees the um, if a person sees the, the actual true COVID, uh, at that point, their, 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 their immune system will be primed so that they will be able to instantly kill it. Um, that is the thought, um, and that is the hope that it will actually be successful. Uh, and as you probably were aware, the first vaccine uh, trials 
uh, starting the first two participants in the UK late last week. Um, but you've probably also heard that the, that the vaccine development is a slow process. So the, the exploratory and preclinical bits um, were done in record time. I mean, the, the, the virus was only sequenced, or the RNA sequence of the virus was only found out in January, uh, and we were already into, into, into human trials in three months. I mean, that's never been done before in the history of humankind. Um, and I think you know, all credit to those units that have done it, including uh, the Jenny in Oxford, but also there are groups in Israel that have done it in many other countries. Um, the, the problem now is that we have to test this vaccine in human beings. And the way you test it is that you give the vaccine and then wait to see who gets sick. <clears throat> but of course, if the virus is no longer uh, uh, becoming more widespread in the population, you may have to wait a long time for people to get sick. Um, and there is a case in point with Ebola in 2014-15 in, in Africa, in West Africa, where they developed a, a vaccine and they were never able to prove that the vaccine was successful because uh, Ebola was actually stamped out before they had enough patients, uh, people who were affected by it to see whether, whether the vaccine had, had prevented them getting it. So let's, we presume that won't happen here because we've got such a huge pandemic, but we, you never know. We may not actually be able to get the vaccine to prove that it's successful um, for quite some time. And once you've proven the, the, virus, the vaccine is successful, you don't have to manufacture enough doses to be able to give, not in this case to millions, but to either hundreds of millions or billions of people. Um, and that takes something like a year uh, to scale up at the very, very least. So the likelihood of getting a vaccine that is successful in the short term is pretty low. Um, okay, so having said that, um, uh, I want to talk about some of the things we can do which are not vaccine related. <clears throat> and of course, the obvious thing is what we're doing now, which is physical distancing. But as everybody knows, physical distancing um, is draining and there are all sorts of social consequences of it uh, and people are increasingly concerned all over the world about the risks of physical distancing and it really can only be a, a, a bridge to development of some more effective treatment. And so what other things can we do? Well we can develop new vaccines, we could develop new drugs but a new drug can take anywhere between 10 and 20 years to develop. <clears throat> Therefore the obvious thing to do is to do what's called repurposing. To repurpose a drug, the drug that already exists for some other use, uh, and then use that for coronavirus. So um, I'd like to just explain to you now uh, the, uh, the methodology <coughs> that we have to go through. So um, what happens when the virus gets into the, into the body? The virus will then um, get itself into a cell, and that process is an active process. The virus is drawn into a cell, it connects, it attaches itself to a, a, um, uh, something that's sitting on the cell, an antigen, uh, something people may have heard of, which is, um, oh, I've forgotten, I won't tell you, never mind, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, and then once the virus enters the cell, it gets transported through the cell, it gets uncoated, the RNA is then uh, uses the cell's mechanisms, which we have our own RNA, which we make our own proteins, but this one now makes new proteins, which then are packaged up into nice new viruses, which then get uh, pushed out of the cell, ready to infect the next cell. <clears throat> but also, um, the body starts to recognize these things um, and starts producing an immune response. Uh, and that's where some of the problems occur. And <clears throat> so, this is quite a complicated slide. <clears throat> the first round circle is the equivalent of what I showed you in the last slide. <clears throat> and the other three circles represent the immune response. And when the virus breaks out of the cell, it can actually break the cell apart. You get little cell debris. And what should happen <clears throat> is that um, the, hum the antigen presentation part of the immune system sucks up these bits of cell, presents them to the humoral immunity part, which then destroys and that's the end of that but sometimes this doesn't work properly. And <clears throat> when that happens, you get uh, an increase in these molecules called cytokines, 
and a particular one I'm going to focus on, and you'll hear a lot about, is IL-6. Um, and you, these cytokines um, produce what's called a cytokine storm. They, they, the, the immune system becomes overactive and tries to destroy the virus particles. And sometimes it simply gets completely out of hand. So there is, most people work, the, the system works beautifully. And in a small number of people, the system goes awry, very similar to a number of other diseases, <clears throat> which we'll talk about in a bit. But uh, what has been done uh, is that uh, in the laboratory, <clears throat> we've taken a whole series of drugs which have been used for many other conditions. Some of them are true antivirals, some of them are immune modulating drugs, <clears throat> and they've simply tried them against a series of different viruses. So the original SARS virus, the, the severe, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome virus of China in 2004 or five, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, which happened about 10 years ago. And luckily, neither of these went pandemic. They, they remained in the areas that they were found. It was also that these same drugs are tried out against and two very, very harmless coronaviruses. These are actually two causes of the common cold. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we've never actually managed to create a vaccine against the common cold. And that should give you a little bit of pause for thought about vaccines against uh, COVID. And then, and they've tried these drugs out against the new coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2 is also known as COVID-19. And you can see the various colours, and you want to see the ones that are, uh, are purple or orange. And I'll just point out to you, hydroxychloroquine, um, chloroquine uh, is in blue. <clears throat> these are very well-known drugs. Chloroquine is an anti-malarial. Hydroxychloroquine is an immune modulating drug for people who've got conditions such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> uh, and uh, mefloquine is another anti malarial. And then you've got some other ones like uh, ribavirin, which is an antiviral, it's used for hepatitis C. And these all look like to be interesting drugs to take forward. <clears throat> and so the World Health Organization set up what's called a, a platform trial. It's a randomized control trial, and it's very, very simple. Uh, what happens? is that uh, when a person is admitted to hospital, um, the doctors phone up the Solidarity um, Central Helpline and they're told, um, uh, you get, this patient gets remdesivir, this one gets lopinavir, ritonavir, this one gets interferon beta, and this one gets chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Um, interestingly, that's international, but in fact, in the United Kingdom, we have the recovery trial, which does more or less exactly the same thing. And then you'll notice here it's doing lopinavir, ritonavir, an HIV drug, but also low dose steroids. And the point about these, these platforms is they're adaptive uh, and they can test new therapies as they become available. Oh, you don't want to see that, that's for me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let me tell you um, uh, a little bit about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. You've seen that come up quite a few times now in this presentation. So, President Trump, bless his cotton socks, um, uh, made his claim based on a very small study from France, which wasn't very well designed, together with some, de some claims that were coming out of China. <clears throat> but in fact, in the last couple of weeks, um, <clears throat> a couple of studies have, been, um, have come out suggesting that uh, maybe chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine is not as successful. The problem is <clears throat> that the number of patients in these studies are also very, very small. <clears throat> and they all treated patients with very severe late disease. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's, it's really difficult to know uh, whether these drugs are valuable or not. <clears throat> uh, and the, there's something which is really important in research, it's called clinical equipoise. Uh, we don't know the answer. And President Trump uh, and others who jump in <clears throat> risk making it very difficult to um, work out the answer because they do things like pushing up the price of the drug um, by tenfold and, and then they also do something which is really sad which is um, some countries have jumped on the bandwagon so India and Bangladesh who neither of them have enough personal protective equipment for their healthcare workers in very poor rural areas have now announced they're going to give chloroquine to every healthcare worker in those countries once a week <clears throat> to prevent them getting COVID-19. But actually nobody knows whether it works. 
And in those countries where the healthcare systems are already under terrible strain, if they make a mistake and actually the drug doesn't work, they may destroy their healthcare systems, which are already very, very vulnerable. Um, so these are things that we have to be extremely careful about, and that's why high quality science is needed. Now, I mentioned some other drugs, and I'll just quickly run through some of the things these other drugs are, are about. <clears throat> Remdesivir, um, you may have seen in the newspapers. Remdesivir is an interesting drug. It, it's an antiviral. It was de uh, designed to, to treat HIV, but it didn't work. Um, it was then tried in Ebola, and in Ebola it was sh shown to be safe, but not terribly effective. And until last week, it was considered to be the most promising antiviral drug for COVID-19. Now, remember, the patients we, we are really focusing on treating are those who are in intensive care units, and they're the ones who have got the most severe disease. Uh, a paper was published by accident on the WHO website and then removed, suggesting that actually remdesivir had no effect on patients with severe COVID-19. But that may not be very surprising, because the people who've got the severe disease are not the ones with the highest viral load, but are the ones who've got the most strong immune response and maybe targeting people in ITU with remdesivir is the wrong thing to do. There's another trial going on at the moment, looking at patients earlier on in the, in the course, so people who've been admitted to hospital on oxygen, but who have not uh, needed to be escalated to, to ITU, and it may be more successful in that group. There's no data available yet. And I sit on a research committee at the UCLH, part of the Biomedicine Research Centre, which I showed you earlier. Um, and we are looking all the time at all these uh, drugs and what's happening. Uh, and there are a whole series of other things coming out. So we, we are always trying to monitor what's going on and then try to make sure we're doing the very best trials uh, on the patients in our hospital. And so there's a, a drug called toxilizumab. Um, and that is uh, a drug that is a immune modulator. Uh, it's uh, uh, interleukin-6, as I told you before, is a part of the very important pathway which drives um, uh, autoimmune conditions such as celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, Graves disease, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Et and toxilizumab is a drug that has been developed for these, for these, uh, uh, these indications, and it is being actively uh, uh, studied to see whether it may help in the cytokine storm that happens to the patients who end up in intensive care with uh, COVID-19. There are some other completely uh, experimental drugs, um, and there's something called JAK inhibitors. I quite like JAK inhibitors. There's one called tofacitinib, one's called ruxolitinib, also great names, but they're all basically working on the same sort of idea to try and calm down the immune system. <clears throat> and then there's something called plasma exchange. If somebody's very sick, and they've got a, a, a hyperactive immune system, um, in, their, in their blood, in the plasma in the blood, there will be a lot of these cytokines, the IL-6, and all these things which are driving the immune response. <clears throat> and the cytokine storm, um, if a person came to hospital and didn't have an infection, but did have an overactive uh, uh, immune system with a cytokine storm, actually plasma exchange would actually be a standard of care. And so this approach has been tried in a small number of patients, and the initial data look interesting, but of course a bigger trial is going to have to take, take place. Um, so uh, I'm going to come back now to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, because uh, these are going to be this is the focus uh, of the rest of what I'm going to say. Um, so uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have been in use since 1930s. Um, chloroquine uh, has direct antiviral effects. Uh, it inhibits the pH dependent steps of the replication of several viruses, but it also has immunomodulatory properties. And hydroxychloroquine, as I said, is used for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so let me just show you um, how these drugs interfere with the pathway I showed you before. <clears throat> so you can see now chloroquine actually prevents uh, the pH dependent entering of the, of the virus into the cells. It also inhibits the replication of the virus in the cells. So these will be at early stages of the disease, <clears throat> but it also has an effect on the cytokine storm, which may happen in the later part of the disease. Um, so potentially chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine should be great, and particularly if used early, but uh, 
At present, no one knows whether that is the case or not. Um, so I've mentioned this concept of equipoise. We need to do research. <clears throat> and here uh, we come back uh, to what we do in the research sphere uh, and uh, the study that I'm involved in. And you may like the name, it's called the Crown Coronation Study. <clears throat> Crown Coronation, chloroquine repurposing to healthcare workers for novel coronavirus mitigation. And you can guess what the bit at the bottom is about, and I'll talk to you more about that afterwards. Um, so the Crown Coronation Study is part of the Crown Group. We are the Coronavirus Research Outcomes Worldwide Network. Um, and why are we called that? <clears throat> well, it turns out that COVID-19 uh, affects different parts of the world in different ways. Um, so uh, you, the, the darker the colour, the more people who are affected by, by coronavirus. The United States of America currently has the highest rates in, in the world. We're not very far behind in, in Europe. <clears throat> Russia it seems to be doing quite well. Australia and New Zealand actually got, they've got, New Zealand's got nothing and they've, they've given up worrying about it at the moment. Um, Australia, it just simply didn't take off at all. South Africa, it's just started to take off. And in the, su the sub-Saharan area of Africa, uh, there was nothing until a couple of weeks ago, and it's now rapidly starting to take off. Um, and these are rather worrying <clears throat> because these parts of the world, not We've lost you. We've lost, we've lost the whole broadcast. The professor has frozen. Do you want to send him a, 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 a comment? Just to... Lawrence, we can't hear you. Can Michelle, maybe Michelle, if you can let him know, let Lawrence know. I'll do it. Oh. Okay, so they're aware apparently. I'm just can, you, can you hear me again? I'm back. I was back. Yeah, Hello. I can hear you. I'm back, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you get? Oh, you can hear. Great. Okay, we can hear. Thank you very much. Okay, Lawrence, I'm going to mute everybody again, and you go for it. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm back. Um, hang on, let me just share my screen. Apologies, the, the internet went. Down. There. Okay. I'm okay, I'm I'm with you. Um, <clears throat> and what I was showing you before my internet went down. Apologies about that. Um, is uh, the the, the countries that are involved in our study. We have investigators from the United States, Canada, the Republic of Ireland, UK, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, Senegal, or Camps Cameroon, Senegal, Australia, New Zealand. I'm really learning my, my world, um, world atlas here. And, and the reason that we are working together as a team uh, is because this is really a world related issue. It's terribly, terribly important that uh, we, get this, we get this right and we do it together. Um, so um, what is the aim of our trial? The aim of our trial uh, is to check, to see whether chloroquine or, or hydro, in fact, we're, we're, we're focusing on chloroquine, whether chloroquine is effective at preventing COVID-19 in healthcare workers. <clears throat> and even if they do get it, can we mitigate the severity? So instead of getting bad COVID-19, you only get it very mildly. And, what, and then the third question is, what's the minimum effective dose? Chloroquine can be given daily, and yet in India and Bangladesh, they're giving it weekly. So we've actually got a series of arms in our study looking daily to twice weekly to weekly, and then we have another arm, which is a, a placebo, um, so that it's a, a sugar-coated pill, to see whether chloroquine works better than a placebo and which is the lowest dose uh, that actually works. And there are quite a lot of strengths to this type of trial. <clears throat> First of all, if we can prevent and mitigate the disease, um, that would be a fantastic thing to do. 
Um, and if we can do that in healthcare workers, whose role is critical in responding to it, with being proactive and trying to stop people getting sick at a double level, because if the healthcare workers stay well, then they have the chance to stopping other people getting sick as well, or looking after them if they do get sick. And that makes it uh, viable for patients. But of course, if it works for healthcare workers, then of course it can be rolled out to you, the general population, as long as we can find a dose level where we can make enough pills. Um, and making hundreds of millions or billions of pills in itself is quite a task. You'll be interested to know that all of the drug uh, so far is made in India. And when President Trump announced that chloroquine was the, the savior of the world, India locked its borders because it was keeping it all for its healthcare workers. Um, I'm pleased to say in the last few days, uh, the borders have been, have been a little bit eased due to quite a lot of political lobbying that we've been doing in the background. Um, and uh, we now have the chloroquine, which has been specially made for our trial. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, we've worked on is making what's called an adaptive design so that the number of people we actually test the drug on depends on how well the drug is doing. Um, and that's quite neat uh, because you may need only a small number of people if it's doing, if it's doing, if it's got a, makes a big difference. But if it only has a small difference, then you're going to need uh, a lot of people. Uh, to, and let me just show you this because this is quite interesting. Um, so, give me one second. I'm going to show my screen again. Um, so, here you can see a rather complicated looking graph. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk you through this. The, the, the graph on the left says chloroquine has an odds ratio of people who are taking it getting COVID-19 0.6. What that means is, under normal circumstances, would get COVID-19. If they're treated with chloroquine uh, and it works at this level, only 60 will get the disease. Now, you may say if you want to prevent everybody getting disease, that's not realistic, not in this scenario. But if you can stop four out of every 10 healthcare workers getting the disease, that's actually a big improvement. <clears throat> um, and then the question is, well, if you're going to work out, if you need to work out how many people you need to prove that it works, it depends on how many of them are going to get sick. If the attack rate with COVID-19 is 25%, and that's certainly what it has been in London recently. I mean, in my group at UCH, uh, in fact, near half of the doctors have actually got COVID-19, uh, and most of them have been tested, so you know that's real. And, but it may be in other areas, outside London, uh, areas where perhaps they're more rural, uh, certainly other parts of the UK, the attack rate may be lower. And you can, if you want to declare, uh, the probability of declaring success at 80%, you're going to have to have somewhere in hundreds, or maybe a couple of thousand people in each group uh, to be able to prove that's the case. But if the drug only reduces the risk of getting COVID, by 30%, and that's still a, a valuable thing to do. And if your attack rate is only 5% of your healthcare workers, which is possible, although probably unlikely, then you need 12,500 in each of your four groups. And that means your trial needs 50,000 people. And because one in 10 people is going to drop out, that's just the way that the, these things work, you need 55,000 people. Our trial has been designed uh, for up to a maximum of 55,000 people in total. And, and I can't stress, stress too much the importance of Africa. Um, it's a very vulnerable population with many other dangerous diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, and HIV already devastated Africa once. <clears throat> and uh, Africa could be devastated again. There are very few health workers per capita. There's very limited personal protective equipment in Africa. Um, and the same thing applies, of course, in many other countries uh, in the developing world. Um, but particularly in Africa, physical distancing is really quite a problem. I mean, a lot of people will be aware of, about some of the awful living conditions that, that people live in in that continent. And so from the start, three quarters of our participants, three out of our four groups receive the active drug. And then because we have a, what's called a response adaptive design, we keep checking every couple of thousand people we enroll. Um, and we're enrolling these people very fast. We want to get this, this trial, the first results out within three months. And so, um, and that's why you need to have loads and loads and loads of, of people involved. We have 50 sites in the UK signed up uh, already, and we haven't even started yet. And we have similar numbers in all the other countries that are involved. And so we can actually push the trial in one, uh, one size or another, in one direction or another, depending on the initial results that we get. And 
the value of the lowest effective dose schedule is absolutely crucial because we have a limited supply of chloroquine. Um, so I'm almost done. Um, uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm coming towards the end, um, and I hope that I've given you some some sort of some sort of understanding of just how complex this area is and some of the challenges that we need to meet. Um, I uh, I'm hopeful that we will actually be able to do something very good uh, here, and we will be able to make things better uh, for the general community, whether it's through the vaccination, whether it's through social distancing, whether it's through drugs that may mitigate the disease when it comes, but actually can prevent it in the first place. And the nice thing about the trial that I'm doing is that we're not wedded to chloroquine. If it turns out that it's not very good, we already have a series of other ideas. And because we have our crown network, which is a national, international network, we can actually plug into that network other drugs. And that is something we want to do. Um, before I finish, uh, I'm afraid I am going to do one thing, and you'll forgive me for this. <clears throat> um, I want to tell you, we won, uh, in theory, we won, uh, what am I showing you? I'm show not showing you anything at all. Sorry, just hang on a second. Um, uh, it's okay. Uh, so in theory, uh, we won nine million pounds uh, last week. In practice, we didn't. In practice, we've only won four and a half. We have to do milestones. We have to show that we've got there. Um, we also had drug given to us for free. Uh, it turned out that the drug that was given to us for free wasn't suitable and we now have to buy the drug and because the drug has gone up in price tenfold um, we are now having to pay a lot of money. It costs about £30 per month per healthcare worker to enrol in this trial. We would like you to consider being part of our, our group um, and helping us to, be, to raise the shortfall we have um, you just go to the Just Giving uh, website, open the Just Giving webpage, type in Crown Coronation, and then you'll be able to donate. And we would really encourage you to consider doing this. There are many other things you've got to spend your money on at the moment. And if that's not for you, don't worry. But if you can, we'd be very, very grateful. Um, before I finish, uh, I, I think I'm going to stop there. And I, and let, let's just move on to some questions, if that's all right. OK, so. Um, is there, have you received any questions on chat? Because I'm looking here um, at the sort of universal ones and I can't see any directed for everybody. So um, Lawrence... The answer is that I did, but I simply lost the chat. Ah, okay. So maybe I will unmute people. So the, 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 I did have some, but they will disappear. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody has done a question and oh, we've already got one about immunity testing. Um, so uh, immu immunity testing is a really, really interesting and slightly complicated area. Um, we ideally want to know uh, whether uh, it is whether immunity is going to work. Um, we, we know that the common cold, you get the common cold one year and you get a common cold the next year. And one of the worries is that immunity, uh, which almost certainly occurs, <laughs> is going to be short term. And that will become clear as time goes on. Um, in the the other problem was that a lot of these tests that were developed uh, for immunity testing so there, there are two types of tests there's the test which is the swab in your nose or in the back of your throat and which is testing whether you have COVID-19 now there is a blood test which is looking at uh, antibodies to test whether you have immunity uh, and the antibody blood tests um, are they're probably quite good in the short term particularly if you know how to use them but there are significant limitations and one of the worries is if you if you roll them out too widely people will misinterpret what they mean and therefore won't take them any, uh, will, will, will presume they're new when they probably aren't um we're being asked about what other drugs might be promising um you know there is a list uh, of drugs that uch we look at every week we're looking at a, a dozen new candidates um, and there are the, the early phase trials where you just do on 10 20 50 people and then the later phase trials when you do on hundreds or, or thousands and um, there are so many uh, particularly immune related drugs that's where everybody's focusing at the moment is can we somehow uh, affect the, the immune response uh, rather than giving the antivirals um, so um, can i ask about what factors decide who enrolls for which trial 
when they enter hospital as a corona patient? <laughs> so that's a really good question. Um, uh, Lawrence, can I'm it's sorry to interrupt? The answer to your question, oh. who gets into which one? Yeah, sorry, go on. So uh, the, who, who gets into which trial? First of all, depends which hospital you're in. If you're in um, a district general hospital uh, where they have limited research resources, you're going to go into one of these platform trials, which are relatively straightforward to, to get into, where you can get large numbers of people enrolled very quickly um, for relatively small effort on behalf of the, the staff in the hospital, which is very important because the staff are so overworked. If you're in a hospital like my hospital, UCH, which has a very strong research focus, um, then it is much easier to get into one of the newer, um, but much more f um, limited sort of early phase studies. And that may or may not be a good thing because uh, if, a, if, a, if a drug is being tested in, in a big area, there's already initial early data to suggest it's useful. So it, it's very much, I, I, I don't want to say potluck, but it really depends on the interests of the doctors and nurses in the hospital you're in. And also, of course, there's something called stratification. So if you come in and you, you're requiring oxygen, you're going to get into a different trial than if you come in and you're on a ventilator. Um, so th there's quite a lot of things that have to be thought about. Um, Lawrence, I'm so really sorry to interrupt you, but surely these trials are what, they're, what they are entered into. Does that not depend on their underlying conditions, i.e. if they're suffering from cancer or if they're suffering from rheumat rheumatism, yes. any of these yes. things? Surely yes. that's pinpointed to different drugs because they yes. will have already been treated with certain drugs. Yes, you're, you're, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right, Mindy. Um, and there are, in fact, a series of trials going on for specific subgroups, so for diabetics and patients with certain cancers, for blood cancers, for solid cancers. You're right. Uh, but th there are there are over a thousand trials going on <clears throat> and they're all doing slightly different things. Um, so uh, the next question, regards production of chloroquine is found successful. Yes. Sorry, was is there a question there? Uh, can you hear me? Lawrence, do you want to just take, okay. um, you know what I'm going to suggest actually, because I can see that there are lots oh. of questions, but I'm also aware that the time is drawing to an end. So I'm going to suggest that we uh, wrap up, but if, if we can ask you to stay for another 10 minutes or so, and those who want to, you can see how many of these questions you can answer after we've sort of wrapped okay. up. Does, does that sound okay? Okay, okay so. That's fine, Okay, so so let me just say on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for such a, a fascinating, I mean, you've illuminated for us, you've given us the, the, the history and the breadth and the geography of the trials that are taking place and really helps us understand how, um, how, how any cure could attack the the actual, I don't know, the, the, the parts of a cell, I'm, as you can the tell, disease. I'm not the, very, disease. the disease, the, the gene, disease. The, yes, yeah. the, the RNA, I think, was the term that you used. So yes, you. you should be very proud that I've actually learned something and I can actually, you know, tell well, it back to you. I, I, well, I, I, want to con I want to say that I like coming to learn from you when you did those British Museum tours, they're fantastic. So, <laughs> learn from mutual, you. mutual. Um, and, and about your research particularly about your research and repurposing drugs and how that can really help um, and particularly what you said about the chloroquine um, and what I found really fascinating is the importance of what people say and how that can have such a huge impact as you've shown just now you on no idea. on on everything yeah. so so thank you very very much it's been absolutely amazing and as I say there's another uh, five or ten minutes um, if anybody wants to stay and listen to Lawrence it's all being recorded I'm staying on so okay Lawrence yeah, so I'll, I'll just keep going I'll keep going John, all right yeah so uh, if chloroquine is found successful can the current production set up produce enough of the drug and are there plans for scaling up so I know that everybody is now rushing to scale up production of both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine um, uh, you'll be interested to know one of the problems of course we have in the UK um, is that we are no longer part of the EU and in any case if we were uh, each country is putting up its borders Germany stopped uh, exporting 
ventilators, we're having to make them in the UK. Um, uh, India stopped uh, exporting hydroxychloroquine, we're making it in the UK. Uh, we, are, uh, we are starting to ramp up production of these medications in the UK. So yes, there, there definitely will be ramping up production. And in terms of whether there'll be enough, it really depends on how many people um, need it uh, and what dose you need to give. Um, so there may or may not be, and that's why we want to go find the lowest possible dose. Do I think Israel is safe in the UK at present? That's a great question. Um, Israel has had one tenth of the number of uh, cases and deaths for the UK. Why is that? It might be because Israel was much more draconian with the lockdown. And if so, well, as the lockdown gets less, so Israel may have a takeoff in cases. It might be. There is some suggestion that the drug, that the, the, um, the bug um, survives less well in hot humid. Now, Israel hasn't been hot and humid recently, but it's about to get hot and humid. And then it might be that Israel will indeed remain safe. Lawrence, you've frozen. Um, oh. uh, but certainly Northern Europe has been very badly hit. As healthcare workers have been affected to greater rate because the vi it's, it depends on the amount of virus a person exposed to, we presume so, or we presume that's exactly what's going on. And it may not be actually within the, the wards in the hospital, but it might be because we're not social distancing. If you, if you think you've got doctors and nurses, they have to have tea breaks. Um, and they also have to come to work potentially on the, on the tube and the bus. Um, and there may well be other sources of infection, not just the patients themselves. Um, if, one, if one healthcare worker is sick, everybody else around them may get sick as well. Can I repeat my opinion about masks and do I advise wearing them? Germany has just said masks are de rigueur for everybody. My mask, my surgical mask, okay, very simple surgical mask, that mask protects you, it doesn't protect me. Uh, if I want to protect me, I need to get the, the special FFP3 masks. But I think that a visor may well protect me. And I and a lot of colleagues have been discussing why not have this physical, very simple plastic sheet which protects my face and stops drop, droplets coming towards me. I don't know why it's not being discussed. Maybe it's not going to be acceptable, but I would have thought that makes an, an enormous amount of sense at least to wear a face mask to protect everybody else. And I think to wear a visor to protect yourself, I, I, I'm happy to do it. Um, but the, again, the evidence is still, uh, still light and it may well be that it turns out not to be correct. Um, are hydrocortisone users for Addison's uh, disease protected? Pass, I don't know. There are many uh, illnesses that actually make people more prone rather than less prone. I don't know, I've not seen anything about Addison's disease and I can't comment on it. What are the risks of walking outdoors without masks where the two meter distance is kept and the place is not crowded? The risks are extremely low. If you're not near to anybody else and you're in the open air, the likelihood of you picking up COVID-19 is exceptionally low. I don't have a problem with that. But the issue about wearing masks is that you're wearing a mask going into shops or going in the street where other people are coming nearer to you. Now, if you're going for a walk in the park, I don't wear a mask when I go in the park. Um, is coronavirus like influenza? So will a vaccine will have to be constantly updated as the virus mutates? It's a really good question. Initially, people thought the virus wasn't mutating. Um, I saw a paper came out about three days ago suggesting that there have been 30 different mutations found of this, uh, of this virus. Whether that will mean that, that, that actually uh, we, we will not be able to develop a, a suitable vaccine is really, we don't know. Um, but it's one of the really worrying questions. Uh, we'll just have to ask. Um, and that's why all the other things are so important. And do underlying conditions such as cancer dictate um, presumably what drugs you use? Uh, yes, or the outcome? Yes. Uh, under, undoubtedly, that underlying conditions um, have a problem. So for example, if somebody has surgery and picks up COVID-19 in the post-operative phase, that's very, very, very serious. That's becoming clear. And that's why all surgeries have been locked down. So for example, at the moment, cancer surgery has been taken out of standard NHS hospitals and, and the private hospitals in London have become NHS cancer hospitals. <clears throat> and they, they, um, they, they check uh, rigorously and won't let anybody with COVID-19 through the door. Um, indeed, we had a, a gastric cancer patient at UCH last week who was due to have their surgery moved across to, uh, to one of the other hospitals. And the day before that the patient went, the patient in the bed next door tested COVID-19 positive and our patient was cancelled. And so we had to move our patient into a side room, quarantine them for a week, show that they didn't get the COVID-19, and then they were able to come across to have the surgery. Um, uh, can I predict uh, the effect of the, how 
uh, mutation of virus will affect concurrent successful research outcomes? No, I really can't. Uh, I think this is really a very open question. It's fascinating. What do I think about reopening schools? That is very much a political question. Um, I didn't show you. There's actually a whole load of, of issues around modelling. Um, and and uh, there's a fascinating uh, model that's been put out by a group associated with the Imperial Group, and I'm pleased to say I'm now working with them, um, which can actually, you can start modelling all these sorts of parameters. But no one really knows the answer. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think we will have to look at, at, at easing the lockdown in a incremental way but i think that's we're going to have to get lots of feedback as time goes on to work out what, what works best um, please give a relief solution for dyspnea with no oxygen issues many get a lot even after four weeks often related to strong anosmia so people who have got uh, shortness of breath without needing oxygen can i suggest how that is treated i'm afraid it's not my area of expertise and i do not know the answer i'm so sorry um go and consult your doctor but that's not a very helpful thing to say but i don't know the answer and is it still the case the majority of critical patients are male and if so why is it the case yes it is um, men are more likely to do badly with COVID-19 women I have not yet seen a reasonable explanation for this um, so we are aware are we aware of any hospitals in the UK particularly London who have better outcome against corona the answer is yes actually um, my hospital UCH uh, came out with the best outcomes in London uh published yesterday but why that is there may be many reasons for that um but we happen to come out best um and how do i balance the side effects of chloroquine against potential benefits so yeah i i, I hinted this issue about side effects um chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine actually are very very safe drugs if taken at the correct dosages it's when they're taken in overdose or taken by the wrong people so people who have for example if somebody's got heart rhythm problems they should not be taking the drugs or if people are taking other drugs which can uh, have uh, they can have interactions then they mustn't do that and in our trial we've uh, put in a huge number of safeguards to make sure that doesn't happen uh, ibuprofen is exacerbation of coronavirus true or false um we, yes that's right it is true or false correct well done um israel population is 10 percent of ours their death rate is one percent of ours not 10 percent correct and uh, the the the, pop, the the per hundred thousand their, their death rate is 10 percent of ours which is the same thing as you're saying just saying in a different way um uh, is research being carried out on the effectiveness of visors to protect people from infection do i think a simple visor made by schools might be effective in protecting one so there is no data that i know of but i personally think that it makes sense but again that's the donald trump effect isn't it except uh, i think there's a, an argument for what i'm saying i don't i really don't know whether visors work but i think they probably will um and uh somebody suggested high dose intravenous vitamin c do i have any thoughts um i will make a comment about videos of well-qualified mds who've had success with this that and the other um uh, there was a video that went round a couple of months uh, a few weeks ago of uh, some doctor in new square did anybody see it the doctor the gp in new square who gave his uh, gave chloroquine to all the people in new square and you know all the the uh Hasidim in new square and none of them got covid um i take that with a pinch of salt um and indeed that was part of the evidence that, that donald trump relied on i think one has to be very careful about one or two people making comments you need to have proper trials and if my trial shows you anything we need up to fifty-five thousand people to show whether a drug works be really careful about over interpreting data um and if you've had MERS would you have any uh, any protection against COVID-19 I don't know no one knows can you get the virus twice there is a suggestion that some people already have uh, there's a, it, there's some data came out of Korea South Korea suggesting that a small number of people have actually been infected twice so it, w this whole issue about immunity is a real issue it's not a joke and I don't know the answer and I think we've come to the end of the questions um, thank you so much for listening and I wish you all a, a very good evening and a Yom Chag HaAtzmaut Sameach tomorrow. Um, and with that, I'm probably we're done, right? Thank you very much, Lawrence. Thank you for rattling through those questions and really, I think you just covered them all. So that was amazing. Thank you again. Thank good night, you, everybody. everybody. I hope you're interesting. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.